logical thinking. Will learning how to symbolize sentences and prove theorems in any of these logical systems help you to become a better critical thinker? Will it help you to do better at detecting bad arguments when you encounter them and constructing good arguments of your own? Will it help you be a more persuasive speaker and writer? Now, my answer, you shouldn't be surprised to hear, is both yes and no. Now, why no? Well, one reason for skepticism has to do with the fact that we as human beings are generally very bad at transferring skills that we learn in classroom exercises to applied contexts outside the classroom. But this is true across a wide range of disciplines. It's been studied by learning psychologists for many years. You can teach a physics student how to solve problems using Newton's laws of motion, but outside the classroom, when asked to reason about a real physical situation on the fly, they'll often default to the physical intuitions about motion and force and inertia that they had prior to taking the class, which are much closer, it turns out, to Aristotle's physics than to Newton's physics. Another example, most people with training in statistics don't seem to fare much better than the rest of us at real-world tasks involving reasoning about probabilities and uncertainty. And there are similar results in biology, economics, history, and so on. So this gives us some reason to question just how effective taking a single course on formal logic will be in improving critical thinking skills. But a more specific reason for skepticism has to do with the fact that most of the skills you learn in a formal logic class just aren't relevant to real-world critical thinking contexts. For example, in propositional logic, you learn how to use the method of truth tables to prove that an argument form is valid or invalid. But that actually involves constructing a table and looking at all the possible combinations of truth values for all the different component propositions. Now what you're doing there is learning an algorithmic procedure for testing validity. It's theoretically very interesting that you can do this, but it's not something you will ever find yourself doing in the real world. And there are tons of examples like this. So these are some reasons to question whether a background in formal logic by itself is going to do much to improve your critical thinking skills. And I'm not the only one saying this. Let me read you this quote from philosopher John Heil, who is the author of a textbook on formal logic called First Order Logic, A Concise Introduction. Here's John Heil, page four, quote, I have thus far omitted mention of one reason widely cited for taking up the study of logic. By working at logic, we might expect to enhance our reasoning skills, thereby improving our performance on cognitive tasks generally. I have not emphasized this supposed benefit, however, because I am skeptical that there is much to it. The empirical evidence casts doubt on the notion that training in logic leads to improvement in ordinary reasoning tasks of the sort we encounter outside the classroom." Unquote. That's pretty sobering coming from the author of a textbook on logic. I understand his point. But I'm not quite as pessimistic as this. I think that, and I've said it in a previous podcast, some training in logic is essential for effective critical thinking. The important question is, which parts of logic are important for critical thinking and which parts aren't, and why? Well, to answer this, I'm going to try to list five real-world benefits, five ways that the study of logic can really improve your critical thinking skills. Here's benefit number one. Taking sentences in ordinary language and symbolizing them in logic might seem like a pointless exercise. But one thing this exercise does is make you aware that language does have a logical structure and that seemingly minor changes in this structure can have a dramatic impact on the meaning of what you're saying. Studying formal logic makes you appreciate and value clarity and precision in your use of language. In argumentation, you want to have control over what you're saying. You want to say exactly what you mean and mean exactly what you say. And a background in logic can really help you develop this awareness. I have students all the time who are surprised when I point out on a quiz or a test or an essay that what they meant to say is not what they in fact said. And the issue turns on the fact that, for example, they mistakenly think that if A then B means the same thing as if B then A. A little formal logic can really help to sensitize you to these kinds of nuances and meaning. Okay, here's benefit number two. A background in logic gives you a basic vocabulary for talking and thinking about arguments. When you study logic, you learn a bunch of concepts that are central to argument analysis. Concepts like the difference between a valid argument and an invalid argument, a strong argument and a weak argument, a sound argument and an unsound argument, a deductive argument and an inductive argument, and so on. With this vocabulary in hand, you can ask questions you could never ask before. You can devise strategies for refutation you would never have considered before. And you can communicate this understanding to your audience in a more effective way. Moving along, benefit number three. 
In everyday reasoning contexts, we generally use only a handful of really simple argument forms. And these are commonly encountered in your study of categorical and propositional logic. Things like, if A then B, A therefore B. Or, either A or B, not B, therefore A. Or, all A or B, X is an A, therefore X is a B. If you master the logical properties of these common argument forms, you have most of the tools you'll ever need for doing logical analysis of real-world arguments. And you can teach these to 12-year-olds. They're not hard to learn. Benefit number four follows closely on the heels of number three. Once you've mastered this small handful of basic argument forms, then you're in a good position to begin studying fallacies of argumentation, which no one disputes is important for critical thinking. Some of these fallacies are reducible to logical fallacies, and some aren't. Now you'll be in a position to understand the difference which is important for getting a handle on the literature on fallacies. Okay, here's benefit number five, and I consider it one of the most important benefits of learning logic for critical thinking purposes. It's this. The central concepts of logic are the concepts of consistency and contradiction. And these two concepts are at the heart of the relationship between logic and the psychology of persuasion. If we're made consciously aware that we hold inconsistent beliefs, beliefs that altogether entail a logical contradiction, then our natural response, for one reason or another, is to recoil. We see that they can't be all true at the same time, and we feel compelled to look for a way to restore the consistency of our beliefs by rejecting or modifying one or more of them. Logical persuasion relies on the fact that people do, in fact, internalize this principle of non-contradiction. If we didn't, if we encountered people who didn't, who were generally happy to indulge in self-contradiction when it was pointed out to them, then it would be hard to see how they could be moved by rational argumentation of any kind. So, what the study of logic gives us is both a sensitivity to this fact and a set of analytical tools that can help us to reveal contradictory beliefs when they're there by demonstrating to people the logical consequences of their own beliefs, consequences that they may not be even aware of, but that can be shown by following a chain of reasoning. And whenever I think of this aspect of logic, my mind leaps to a quote from the Greek mathematician and scientist Archimedes, who said, Give me a lever long enough, and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. I think of logic in the same way. It provides the lever and the fulcrum that can move people from even the most stubborn position. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not an idealist about this. We shouldn't expect people to give up their most cherished beliefs just because they're shown to be inconsistent with other things that they believe. People can restore consistency by making changes elsewhere in their belief system, and that's normally what they'll do. But the fact that they felt compelled to make a change at all is the point that I'm getting at here. So what's the conclusion of all this? What's the takeaway message? The takeaway message is that if you want to develop as an independent critical thinker, you shouldn't ignore logic. You should devote some time to studying elementary logic. But when you study logic, your focus should be on understanding basic logical concepts developing what I would call logical literacy and mastering the small handful of basic argument forms that occur over and over again in real-world reasoning contexts. Just about everything else you'll learn in a formal logic course won't be of much direct use to you for critical thinking purposes. Now, on criticalthinkingtutorials.com, I have a tutorial course called Basic Concepts in Propositional Logic and a course called Common, Valid, and Invalid Argument Forms, which introduce what I think are the most important logical concepts based on the criteria I just gave here. I don't cover proof methods or derivations. I focus on developing logical vocabulary and providing the foundation for understanding the handful of argument forms that we generally see over and over in argument analysis. Anyone taking a symbolic logic course will find this material very incomplete, but that's on purpose. I've intentionally selected the bits that I think are actually helpful from a critical thinking standpoint and ignored the rest. So if you're interested, you're welcome to check that out. Well, that's it for the show today. Once again, I didn't actually cover everything that I said I'd cover in the previous episode, so I should probably learn from this and keep my mouth shut. But I'll go out on a limb and say that the next episode, we're going to talk about two other essential components of critical thinking. First is argumentation, and the second is rhetoric, the art of persuasion. I'm very interested in the relationship between argumentation and rhetoric from a critical thinking standpoint, and I've got a few things to say about that. Plus, I'll have some takeaway critical thinking tips. So until then, thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great day.